I believe the first thing on our agenda is um, so Freddie from Open Space is sorry I have to accept all of these buttons. Um, Freddie from Open Space is coming to talk to us about their native pollination preservation garden project that they're um, they're still drafting up the CPC application, but was gonna share with us and then we'll share the official application later and looking for um, the commission support. All right, so I'll move her over. I'm changing position. All right, Freddie, are you there? Got you on mute right now. I am. There you are. Yep. Hey everybody. Hi. I'm Freddie Gillespie. I'm chair of the Southboro Open Space Preservation Commission. And I'm here tonight to talk about our community preservation uh, application. And one of the things we'd like to do is, I think you're all aware, there's different categories of the um, for, for funding projects under the Community Preservation Act, open space being one, but passive recreation is another component of our project, and we'd like to have you listed as supporters. Saying that, a little bit backwards because of timing of when warrant articles have to be in and when we have to meet with other boards and commissions and I don't have all the application ready for you to see the full scope of it and the cost. So I don't expect you to say, yes, you support a project, you don't see everything. And I also was hoping to give you a PowerPoint presentation, but that also didn't come to fruition by tonight. So I'd like to come back on your next meeting in December 16th, I think it is, 18th, somewhere. I, yeah, I, I want to say it's the 14th, but we have to finalize that date. Okay. So. And if that would be all right, but I did want to just give you a little rundown to see if this is anything that would interest you to be supportive of our, um, our project ideas. So I don't know if any of you have noticed, there's some pink flags at the library. That's part of phase one. We've been working all summer putting in a flower garden, pollination preservation garden. And that's been done um, with the labor, mostly of volunteers. We had some grant funding to purchase equipment from the library, um, plants and equipment, as well as the Open Space Commission donated um, funds and lots of resources. And it's been a lot of volunteer labor over the summer, but it's been a lot of fun. And that's where the recreation piece comes into it because gardening is a passive recreation activity. I know you've participated with the library's uh, uh, sowing uh, seed program and the Open Space Commission, because we are focused on native plants, it's a little bit different than typical gardening. And that's where we come in and help people learn and also um, provide guidance and plants or seeds. And one of the things we did last year, which we are using this library, we'll be doing it. COVID makes everything challenging. We had done it inside at the library two years ago. Last year, we did it totally remote, except for the volunteers that did the work. And then this year, we're hoping to see if we can do a little bit of a mix up of that with the uh, COVID restrictions going away. But what we did is we went out, we collected seeds, and now we can actually collect seeds at the plants that are at the library and show people how to do that. It won't be a full-fledged because we just put the plants in, not all of them flowered this year, 
but we'll collect the seeds and then have some activities on cleaning and sorting and distributing and then doing a winter sow so that people can have their own plants at home and to also use these plants for other gardens in town. Last year, we had about 20 volunteers who collected seeds, sorted, packaged over 700 packets that were distributed. Over 100 people just uh, participated. And we know that you know not everyone planted their seeds, but the goal was there. And many people did. Um, we've had many, many plants being shared and people starting gardens. So it is a, um, I, we think it's a valid recreation, passive recreation project. Additionally, the area um, we're, we're working on had been a neglected, underutilized, not utilized at all actually, portion of the library property. We plan to use it as an activity area. There'll be art programs in addition to the gardening program, citizen science, and you're wondering what phase two is. Well, if you look beyond where we planted, there's some wooded area up against um, the old rural cemetery. And that those trees are in bad condition. We're going to um, clean it out, clean out the invasive species, replant with shrubs and um, a shrub layer that is part of the requirements to create a full habitat for this pollination preservation garden, as well as some shade loving plants and spring ephemerals. So it's going to beautify it and also create better habitat and an area where um, children and adults can participate in our activities, including citizen science. We're working with a professor to do uh, lots of research. He's been working with us since 2015. Actually, all of these plants came from his research. He adopted Breakneck Hill Conservation Land was his first research site. So without having a full project to see, I just wanted to let you know what the idea is, there'll be art, there'll be gardening, there'll be lots of volunteer work and citizen science in addition to other, um, like one year, I don't know if any of you had children that attended our Caterpillar Lab where we had, um, cat, the, it's actually a science museum that brings their caterpillars to a location so kids can see them and see them in their habitat. It's one of the other types of activities we could have. So there's lots of fun to be had and recreation for sure. And I can go into it more when we have the full fledged proposal. But I guess I'd just say before I leave, were there any questions or am I feeling any? Um, we're very excited about this. Oh, the other thing I wanna mention, if you know the library grounds, there's the new story book walk. And then that goes down to where our garden area is, this habitat area. And eventually we're actually meeting with uh, Karen Galligan and some other DPW people tomorrow to talk about the connection to the new um, park that's going to be where the new road construction is at the back side of the library. And that has a native component too. So there'll be a park through to the, you know, our area, which is science-based. Um, plantings, but we are working with the DPW and Karen on their portion of planting, and it will continue on up to the story walk. So this place that just kind of, as you got out of your car and ran to the library, you barely glanced over, people are already starting to visit and, you know, ask questions, and we'll be doing more programming there. So thank you. Awesome. So yeah, whenever you have that, Freddie, if you want to send that to like Tim and I, we can distribute it to the whole group so everyone has your write up. Um, yeah. Yeah, I think it's it's awesome. I agree. To it's opening up a a new avenue for recreation um, to those who may not you know be interested in the athletics or what have you. So I did want to say that regardless of how this project goes you know, whether it gets funded or, you know, uh, the Open Space Preservation Commission would like to reestablish because we have partnered with recreation in the past. I think um, when Doreen left and then COVID and, you know, you sort of get out of the swing of things, but we used to um, co-sponsor, we used to do like 
kite flying events and nature walks. And, you know, we want to bring that sort of um, activity level back to a shared, you know, open space commission and recreation. And we do know there's a lot of, you know, well, first of all, there's adult recreation, right? And then there's also children who don't fit into the I play soccer or baseball or football. And we think we can provide a lot of um, benefit to those children who, you know, may find citizen science to be the most exciting thing they've done all year. And, you know, we can bring that sort of project to them as well as the art. Yeah, the only thing where my mind kind of was drifting was not to put more work on your plate, but just thinking more ahead to the future is like we have Breakneck Hill, which is nicely located. Um, and then obviously the library downtown and through my head, I was going, gosh, where else do we have kind of that type of space where you could add additional, you know, I'm on the south side of town and my mind automatically gravitated to that park that's near Fitzgerald's. Yes. So again, opportunities well, for the future. So, you know, if and those of you who know me won't be surprised, we already are working on um, a planting at the Beals Preserve, again, on the north side of town, I get that. I'm on the south side of town, so I'm well aware. Um, we have a project we're working on beginning at the golf course. Uh, each one is a little bit different. Then we have the Halloran property. As soon as we get some access, that's over off 85 um, near the Mass Pike Bridge. It runs between 85 it's, it's landlocked. That's why we need some access issues. It goes over to Parkerville. And then certainly Fitzgerald, we're looking at some other land there. One of the great things about our, once we get this up and running, our winter sow project is the number of plants that are created from this. So one woman, we, we after we took care of everyone from Southboro who signed up, we let other people from other towns who heard of it participate. One woman from Chelmsford created one of these pollination preservation gardens. Um, I also chair the regional, it's called the Metro West Conservation Alliance Native Pollination Systems Task Force. It's trying to create, people heard what we're doing in Southboro and they, want, they asked me to come and help them start this. Through 36 communities in the Metro West region, they want to create the same kind of gardens and habitat. And because the reason we're doing it isn't unique to Southboro, we're all in trouble with um, the collapse of our pollinators. Anyhow, um, she participated in our winter sow and then she got some land and she didn't have any money or plants left. And she goes, well, I just planted my winter sow in this big garden. And I said, oh, how many plants did you put in? She said, 200. So one person, I mean, obviously very committed, but with the same amount of seeds we gave anyone was able to create a garden with 200 plants and that is replicable. You know, we know that not every one of the 100 people who participated grew 200 plants, but we actually had people giving us back plants at Breakneck Hill after they said, I have enough for my yard. So we know that this is um, definitely something and we want, what we're trying to do is get people to say, you know, here's some for my yard and here's some for the public garden. And, you know, we'd like to have other people, not just the Open Space Commission say, here's a little space in my neighborhood. I know one neighborhood, they're looking at a cul-de-sac. They go, can we put plants there? I said, well, you have to have permission, but yeah, why not? So yeah, definitely. Then I'll tell you, seeing the butterflies and the birds nonstop in areas that had nothing. I'm literally already at the library. There were, I was there before we planted, no birds, no butterflies, no bees. And just in the end of August, they started to come. So that's, that's awesome. pretty exciting. That is really exciting. It is. Yeah, I'm in the, I'm in the Wedgwood Wildwood Association there and we have tons of common space that, you know, a little pond area that would probably be great opportunities, maybe a cool thing for us, us to do to kind of build our little association up. I'll be in touch. <laughs> Definitely. All Is there right. anything else? No, I think we're good. Thanks, Freddie, for the, the update. And then we'll look for your doc when that comes through. Okay. Thank you. Bye. Bye.
All right. So then we have the Activitas and the Choate study. Yep. So Kelvin and Megan are here. Awesome. Hey, Meg. Hey, Hello. Calvin, how are you doing? Good, how are you? Good. Hey, everyone. Hello. All right, Meg, I'm just, I'm assuming you want to share your screen? Um, it's actually, you can have uh, Kelvin share. That'd be great. Kelvin, I assume yeah. you want to share your screen? So. <laughs> <laughs> It'd be good. Okay. Great. So as, as Kelvin pulls this up, I'll just kind of give an overview. So, you know, we started looking at um, layouts um, that Kelvin's going to kind of jump in and describe in a second. Um, and as we were starting to look at these, um, you know, there's, we decided we'd jump right into cost estimates because there wasn't too much change in kind of the overall footprint that we could really make based on the site. So Kelvin's going to run through what the layouts are, some of the materials, the, you know, site amenities. And then I'll jump, we'll pull up the, um, the cost estimate and, and jump into that a little bit um, and then open up for any questions, discussion, um, all that good stuff. So Kelvin, take it away. All right. <laughs> um, you guys can see my screen, right? Yes. Yep. All right. Uh, so based off the comments and feedbacks from last meeting, um, we kind of created this concept. Um, we did take a look at maybe reorientating the softball field layout um, in different corners to see if we can, you know, get the most out of the field. And I think keeping it sort of where, where you guys have it right now is kind of like the best um, scenario. And so based off this new, this softball layout, this is kind of like the existing condition. So you can actually see that we shifted it slightly. Um, so in this concept, we're replacing your natural grass with uh, infill, in, infill synthetic turf field. It's going to be multi-purpose. And in the next couple of slides, I'm going to show you like the different layouts that we can possibly have for the uh, big turf area in the outfield of the softball. Um, so we're going to have new 20 foot high ball netting along Corderville Road and along the drive going into the uh, police and fire department. So kind of like along, if you could see my cursor, kind of along here and towards to the left field, we're going to have it um, in the grass field to kind of give you a little bit more ball protection, but you're still able to kind of access in between the ball netting to, um, to get on the field to the left. So we're gonna have a new 20 foot high uh, chain link fence backstop with overhang. This replaces your current backstop. Um, new team areas with a feet high chain link fence. We did look into having structures, but based off what uh, some of your comments from last meeting, um, I think chain link fence is probably the best um, as there was no desire for any structures for the team areas. Um, and so in number five, this general area, there is currently some existing utilities. Um, they're kind of like electrical utilities. I did, when I was on site a few weeks back, we, um, I saw some kind of like your Musco cabinet um, there and other utilities. Then there's existing shed that's kind of behind your current backstop. Um, so looking at number five, I if I could just zoom in real quick in this area. Um, we're got enclosed at utility or electrical area off and provide windscreen around it. So it kind of dresses it up a little bit. And 
there is a current a current fountain, existing fountain there. And we're kind of proposing maybe you guys will like a kind of a water fountain slash bottle filling station there. And that would just connect into the existing backflow and the water line that's currently there. So generally it's in the same location. And the there's gotta be a new shed right in this area. That's kind of replacing your old existing shed there. And that kind of opens up this kind of a, a entryway in terms of the softball field in your athletic field here. And let me zoom back out. So we're gonna be maintaining the accessibility from the field in the parking lot. Um, so you're, we're keeping kind of like your general layout here go, with the steps and the ramps. There might be some grading that needs to be, that needs to happen in this general area where my cursor is. Um, but overall, just where the team areas are and uh, the walkway adjacent to the parking lot are, is relatively flat with some constraints are like uh, the athletic lighting and the light poles. So, um, there's got to be a new scoreboard where your existing scoreboard is. Um, and there's, so where your existing muscle lights are got to be padding around them. Um, and I can explain a little bit more why we're going to add padding. Uh, in this next slide. So generally, this is like the first layout that you guys could possibly have in the spring season. So you're getting a uh, softball field and a 7v7 soccer field layout in the outfield. And you could have both simultaneously. As you can see, it's not overlapping anything. Um, what in this yellow dashed line is actually a temporary outfield fence that you guys could put up um, during the season. And I, for something I forgot to mention is that you guys would be having new uh, foul poles too. Um, so the next layout in the spring season, this we could actually fit a 180 by 330 lacrosse field. Um, this will be overlapping a softball field, the softball field. So that's something to consider, but you're able to, with, I know with the corners, you're still able to fit a 180 by 330 lacrosse field. And for the fall season, you're getting a, in the right, you're getting a 9v9 uh, playable field and a 7v7 to the left. And it, this does overlap the, um, you know, the softball. Then I think this is kind of like what you guys were looking for in terms of the overall, you know, full size soccer. So it, we kind of like orientated and kind of wedged it in almost. And uh, with, you know, the, we have with the safety zones, we're still able to get a, 175 by 360 soccer field. And con considering we have existing muscle poles here, this specifically, this one, this has got to be padded around there, but you know, you still have that safety zone in between. Um, so you're getting that full size field, as you can see here. And then we kind of look towards to a potential alternate and expanding the field. Um, I know there wasn't really a desire for expanding over here, but we did take a look at it. And I think it'll really put the whole um, athletic field together if we were to expand it to the left. So um, in this scenario, we will be expanding, adding on turf, and you're still a you're able to get that 7v7 soccer field and potentially two, two five versus five um, soccer. It's overlapping kind of like, um, was it east to west? So you're getting two fields and one 7v7. Then we would have to expand that for like ball netting along Corderville Road. 
and potentially adding more ball editing at the parking lot just to protect um, the cars from getting hit by balls. <laughs> um, and we did take another, another look at alternate being, uh, so there's an existing stone wall that can be um, renovated, improved. So the idea was to maybe potentially removing that stone wall. I know there's a couple of signage um, that are on these piers where my cursor is. Um, we can potentially relocate that. So if we were to remove the wall, we can uh, improve it by putting in ornamental fencing along the along the road and um, kind of just feather the grades in a little bit, it kind of cleans up the whole entire site. Um, I think I pretty much covered it all. Um, we'll have to kind of, so there's existing trees along kind of this area that in order for us to kind of like make that warm up area, we might need to remove those last three trees there, but we are proposing adding in more vegetation and um, we did add in a allowance for that in the cost. And um, I think that's pretty much it. Did I miss anything, Meg? <laughs> no, I think that's it. I think let's go over to um, to cost and we okay. can chat about that. So. Okay, perfect. So we pulled together um, a cost opinion um, and this is for total project cost. So the numbers that you're seeing as, as Kelvin had mentioned, we have kind of our base bid project, which is the main softball and multi-purpose field area. And then you can see below the line, we have you know um, a different number of alternates. Um, so we, we look at, all right, in the base bid for alternate one, what would it mean to, what's the cost to change up kind of a traditional sand and rubber for a different, different type of infill, what's that cost? Alternate two is, all right, well, let's expand, you know, to the left to that smaller field area. What's the cost for that? What's the cost for that to be, you know, have a different um, infill, all those types of things. And then the um, sensing improvements that Kelvin had mentioned. And then last is, um, we didn't know if, you know, what level of um, equipment that you guys needed. So we included it now and we can talk about whether that needs to be, you know, remain in the budget or not. So, as I mentioned, these are all probable project costs, which means that it's construction, it is your soft costs, and it's your contingency. Because it's so early in the process, where you know we don't know a lot about the subsoils underneath, we're working off of an aerial, um, we carry a 20% contingency um, in in all these items. And then with that as well, when you do go to design, you know, you're gonna have your designer fees, your geotechnical fees, bidding, construction administration. So we've carried a 10% soft cost fee um, for that, you know, for that portion of the work. So these are full all in total what it's gonna be. The numbers in gray are kind of this, this recent year's numbers. That's what we were using based on just um, the numbers that we had, you know, had received. We like to keep kind of a running tally of um, unit costs. And then we've added a 4% um, in, you know, um, inflation number for years after that, you know, depending on when the town would potentially do this work. So as you'll see that base bid project kind of softball in the, the main multi-purpose area for 2022 costs, you know, we're looking around 2.1 million all in, um, you know, go adding on, um, you know, a, an a organic material or a coated rubber material for your infill. It's about, you know, a $63,000 add. Um, that field over to the left, that smaller field total project for 2022 is around 750,000 um, and so on and so forth kind of down the list. So we're confident in these numbers. Um, you know, I, I think they're on the conservative side at the moment, which is appropriate, especially with that 20% um, contingency in there. We wanna make sure that as you budget, you have all the money that you need and you're not gonna have to go back to it. Um, so we'd like to have a little bit of contingency and a little you know, conservatism um, or conservativeness uh, within those numbers, you know, so you're comfortable going to however you're gonna um, solicit funding. So we do have kind of backup, you know, the, the following pages gets into kind of the, the nitty gritty of um, the estimates, I don't really want to um, bore you guys with kind of line item by line item, but 
We're happy to review questions that you have, questions in the plan. Um, and if I think kind of next steps as we think about that is, um, you know, we would make, our next steps would be revisions to the plan, if you have questions about that, and then updating these costs, you know, appropriately with that. So from there, why don't we start with the plan views, like Kelvin's pulling up right now, and then um, we can open it up for questions. I feel like one of my questions, I don't know if it's for you guys or for us, the commission, but like, what are the thoughts about um, fields that overlap with like the baseball diamond? Like how much is too much or, um, or like, what is the play like when you're crossing those different grades? Like, what does that mean for the players? Jen, that's a great question. So actually you're not going to actually notice a difference in this scenario where you see Brown is just Brown colored turf. It's the same actual oh, material. Oh, okay. It's not dirt. So it's all turfed. It's, okay. Yep. Exactly. Exactly. And okay. This, this graphically, this could change. Like instead of having like full, you know, brown turf, we could have, you know, cutouts, brown cutouts at the bases to signify. But for this, you know, your intents and purposes, this is all turf. It all feels the same underfoot. Gotcha. Okay. Cool. Um, yeah, it I could have, be green if we wanted it to be green. And like she said. Yeah. Right. Okay. Nope, that makes sense. I'd like to talk a little bit about the netting um, and the stone wall actually, because we live in a town that very much values aesthetics. Um, there's a lot of people who hate those lights and I'm just picturing throwing up nets. I think you said they were 20 feet or 30 feet, 20 feet mm -hmm. nets. So are there, you know, we don't, again, opinion of the commission, but we've had the softball field there for years. I don't think the balls going that far has been an issue and certainly we worry about the kids and soccer balls but we've never had an issue so much I think it's from in my mind it's always almost been more about the the kids and and go running after balls um so are there alternatives because I just picture looking at Woodward School and telling people that it's going to be mm -hmm. you know 20 foot high nets in front of it and getting big pushback on that. And then I also wonder if the net netting between the, and I, I know you mentioned that we didn't have a desire to expand to the left, but, we, but I think we definitely do. I think we always pictured maybe a multi-phase project, but eventually the whole place being turf, the whole, the two fields being turfed. Um, if that netting between softball and that the left side's really needed because we don't typically have a, granted this could change, but we don't typically have the two different sports playing at the same time. They kind of have their own allocations. So just curious for other people's opinions about that and if there's alternatives to the 20 foot high net. Yeah, I was yeah. I was going to bring up the same thing. I don't, I don't believe the netting is necessary um, just with we don't have anybody cranking balls like that on the on the field and with the kids being the age they are um, like Jen uh, Kristen said, it's more just making sure they're not running into the street. So I, I guess my focus, if we're, if we're thinking about a protective barrier across Porterville would be more reestablishment of that stone wall, just to make sure it's secure rather than putting up the netting. Um, that would just be my hot take on that. Yeah, I think people would have objections to replacing a stone wall with a fence. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's, let's uh, it kind of depends. The stone wall is sort of, decrepit if you were to replace well, it with a nice fence then maybe there's a there, there's a there's a discussion to be had there but yeah. um you do know, we know I if there's any historical significance to it you know the gate happens. i imagine the gate is which is over on the left hand side um mm -hmm. but even then uh to be honest with you tim like they just replaced the stone wall right at the intersection of 85 and main like yeah. if we were you know if that would almost set the like if, if we were going to do it, then perhaps there's a way to integrate that sort of design and extend mm -hmm. it down into this area, right? That could be a, a, an extended project, right? So I think yep. the, um, the orientation of the field being further away from the street, um, when you think about the playing, and, and it's, not, it's not a softball issue, it's really a, a soccer issue is really what it comes down to. The orientation of the field away from the street, um, I think certainly facilitates, you know, not having as much uh, or potentially um, netting along the back and along the Quarterville road line. But 
Um, this the size that they're showing here is it qualifies as an 11 v 11 FIFA field. Like you can put, you can use this field for anything all the way up through um, high school sports. The, what I what I've seen is that really you run into you know, uh, the high school tournament, you know, it may not, it may be not wide enough for a high school tournament game, but you could have, you know, um, it, it qualifies for just about anything. It's exactly sort of what you would hope to have with, from a design perspective. So along those lines, um, where, you know, the netting is probably most desirable um, is the, um, the sides, the sides really, the side that would face the entrance and exit to the um, safety complex um, and potentially the other side, because you know, uh, those would be the sections that people would be, that the goals would be there and you'd have you know, shots on the goal and now you've got kids you know, potentially running into the parking lot to retrieve a ball or you've got um, you know, um, the, the ball potentially being up on that on that right-hand side, it's hard to sort of envision completely because it's an overhead picture. But um, so from that perspective, you would contemplate like, hey, we probably need something there. Now, you know, how tall does it have to be? If it's set further back away from where the goal is, you probably have relative size and, and whatnot. So, um, and I've seen all manner of um, configurations based on the, on the places that we go, um, where there's even on some of the grass fields have uh, netting. So um, I think there's plenty of, potential options there, but I, I think you would most certainly want to have something on that safety on the, on the side of the safety facility, um, just to, to keep the ball in. And just to be clear, if we, cause I was the seven by seven and nine by nine setup was interesting. Obviously I know we want 11 on the 11 v 11, we would line it to also be able to support nine v nine. Correct. Cause right now we have 11 v 11 at, um, 9-11, I just want to make sure that 9-V-9 and, and ideally 7-by-7 seven seven also have alternatives too. So you can fit a 9-V-9 within 11-V-11, um, but I'll tell you there's not enough 11-V-11 field capacity in town, right? So when we get to the spring and lacrosse has the Saturday mornings, um, yeah, that, makes, yeah. that makes it challenging. So you can, not only could you fit the 9-V-9 in there, but if they were to go back up to one of the other uh, pictures, you could see, there you go, right there, you can actually fit in different configurations, right? So um, the remember, the entire surface is turf. It's really just how you want to orient the lines. Yeah, I just want to make sure, I, I definitely understand we don't have enough of anything, but we don't have any turf for 9 or 7v7, so I just want to make sure. Oh, no, we have, we have 9v9 turf. I've, uh, I got to use the 9v9 turf uh, the first game of the year when we had to split our field at 9-11 with lacrosse, and they, they, uh, it's actually yeah. lined. We, uh, you, so it can be there if, if so chosen. So, you get um, lucky. but anyway, long story short, you can fit it in there, Kristen. Like it, it's, it's configurable. Yeah. Okay. We think it just more for the commission, I guess. I know we're spending a lot of time on soccer, but are we also thinking of lining it like a nine eleven with lacrosse and with field yeah, hockey? Yeah, I, I think you have to have. I think you've got a. The key, Tim, here is you need to maximize the. Um, I just want to make sure that was clear. Yeah. Yeah, you need to maximize the utilization of the field to a, yeah. um, you know, because of the lights and the, and the setup. So whether it's lacrosse or, um, you know, uh, I was doing some side research. Now, you know, you can play uh, bocce and pickleball, all kinds of crazy stuff on, yeah, on turf. So, <laughs> <laughs> so like, I, I think you, I think you have multi, you know, you multi, it has to be multi-purpose. It has to be sort of um, uh, anticipated to be utilized in, in a variety of different ways and, and groups, you know. Can, it's been a little while since we've had this discussion, so I can't believe I forget, but the lining, right? There's, because we're talking about all these options, but if we get the lining, you know, as part of the turf, then it's going to look crazy, right? And, and um, be kind of difficult. And I honestly, I, I forget, even despite all the hours we spent talking about it, how the lining works and our flexibility and changing it up, because I don't think you want, it could get a little out of control. <laughs> Yeah, so so for lines, you can either have permanent lines that are, are stitched or cut into a carpet, and that's to your point. And doesn't give you the flexibility and things around. 
um, or you can paint your lines. Um, and painting obviously, you know, gives you the most flexibility. You can paint lines, you can remove lines, they'll fade, you know, all that kind of good stuff. So, um, you know, you have the ability to do all those things. And I think at this point, you know, from, um, you know, from a, a pricing, from a pricing perspective, it's not going to matter too much, whether we put those in permanently or, or whether we, you know, decide to paint. Um, but, you know, I think for you guys, providing the most flexibility would be in paint, you know, cause you can change them up per season. If, you know, you had, you know, for some reason you had to host a big um, soccer game and then a big field hockey game on this surface, you know, you have the ability to, to take some lines off and put new lines on. So it's not overwhelming, you know, and, and the layouts that you're seeing here that, that Kelvin put together, you know, this layout that we have right now is this is the largest rectangular field that you could fit in this space. You know, we've maximized length at 360. That's the large, you know, the, the greatest length for all sports. Um, and then we're kind of held by that bottom light pole, that bottom right light pole, just where it is. We didn't include potentially relocating. We could, you know, if we wanted to try no. to gain even more no. space, but yeah. No. <laughs> no. But then that's, that's what it would take is, is to relocate that guy. So. If that's not on the table, we will leave it right where it is. Yeah, and, yeah. And I don't want to open the, the, We don't <laughs> want to open up any reconfiguration of the lights. That works. So. That works. <laughs> um, Let's stay the word. <laughs> <laughs> and then Kelvin, just go to the um, the one eighty by three thirty um, layout because that kind of shifts it. Yeah, this one right here. You know, this is your second largest rectangular field um, that you can fit in with that space with the ten foot runoff. You know that that we're showing here. So I mean that. It's, um, you know, boys lacrosse, it fits kind of the small girls lacrosse size that are in minimum dimensions, it fits field hockey. And really, I mean, it fits the soccer field. And, you know, it may not be your, your varsity soccer field, something like that, um, but it certainly can fit an 11 v 11 um, kind of smaller soccer field, but it works. So um, you have the ability to fit everyone on this, but I think you still want the ability to shift things, which, you know, most likely points you towards paint. Yeah, we have paint Thank at our, we have paint at 9-11, so I, 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 I mean, it seems like a, it works. Yeah. Absolutely. Now, I think one question as we, as we think about kind of equipment, like care equipment, and you guys, you know, following the meeting, please take a chance to, to run through the list that we had on there, but um, we can talk about paint equipment, you know, now they have, there's a lot more um, kind of robotic um, paint equipment, you kind of set it and let it run for an hour and, you know, people are off doing their own thing. So if, if those are the kind of the maintenance equipment that's helpful to build into the budget to make these more realistic, we can consider that as well. What are we doing guys at 9-11 right now? Is that just DPW has the equipment? Don't we outsource that? We outsource that, yeah. All the testing and if we're fluffing the carpet and stuff, we outsource that. I mean, if we were to ever be able to move forward, it might be interesting to do a cost comparison of outsourcing versus what it would cost to have equipment. Again, that's down the road, obviously. Mm -hmm. It's also manpower too, and hours yeah. on an understaffed yeah. DPW, right? <laughs> like adding more onto their plate versus just outsourcing it and getting it done when we need it done, so. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's, I mean, that's also, I think, a, a buildable fee, though, built in. So yes. I wouldn't be too concerned on that. So that's way, that's way down the line. So. so when we talk about all these different configurations of fields and different sports, um, I'm just wondering, like, how many is too many? And I ask that because, what, Kristen, we were at a field earlier this year. I want to say it was, like, was it Walpole or something like that? Like, we drove a good distance. The field had so many fields painted on it. I sat there and I was just like, I don't know how the hell anyone yeah. knows what's on this. Like it literally football, like soccer, all different directions. Like they, the they entire could, field they, was like, they, they, if it was, wall, was it Walpole? Was it across the, across the street from the prison? Yeah, brand I new, think so. Brand yes. New brand new facility. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So we played and like, there. I think there are 65 different fields painted on that. And I couldn't, yeah. it was the kids disaster. Are fine. The kids are okay with it. They, the kids, once they get going, that's not even a, they just play. Right. It's not even a, that part, that, that's not uh, like the first, what you do is the first thing you do is you get the instructions. What color? 
<laughs> what color are you? Yeah. Okay. What, what color yeah. line are you? And then that's it. And then honestly, they they go it right. The harder part of that field is that actually the fields are so close together. The whistles like yeah, you like they get distracted by the gotcha. different whistles. They're on top of each other. Um, but that was a great complex with the with the turf and then the grass in the back there. Oh, that was fantastic. Okay. So as you guys look at this, are there any, is there anything that, you know, doesn't make sense? Um, is there anything else that you guys like to see, you know, on the plans? Um, Kelvin, why don't you flip to the one with the alternate in it as well? Could um, you just talk about the, um, when you say the, uh, so obviously we have some decision points, right? So, you know, when you look at the total cost, back to Kristen's comment on the phasing, I don't know like how badly we need the left-hand side in the first phase, right? Because it's gonna be a lot just to get this off the ground uh, with the current sort of cost estimates that are there. Um, but can you talk about the fill? Because anytime you talk to anyone, the first thing they, they get to is, is okay, turf field, what's the fill? Fill's not good, blah, blah, blah. So mm -hmm. what's the, you know, so we would, we would certainly be looking at what's the right fill and, you know, do they still put, is it still like a pad underneath? Like what, what sort of the, um, what sure. sort of from a safety sort of perspective, what's sort of baked into this or, and what would be part of that sort of additional options? Sure. So the base bid option is, um, I'm just looking at my own just to make sure. So we have um, a two inch fiber. All right. And we have a resilient underlayment underneath it. So a pad. So uh, I find for, I mean, we are, Kind of our company likes to do pads. Pads make the field the most safe. Um, you know, if there's an area that um, you know is under maintained or something like that, that field is always safe for people to play on in terms of impact attenuation. So we have a pad in there. Um, the base bid mount is for traditional um, sand and crumb rubber. Um, I think that's what you guys have over at 911. That's you know the majority of fields. Um, you know, it's, I'm not going to go into a whole Kind of thing no, you don't. You don't have to go into coconut that. walnut and all that. But what's the <laughs> what's the sort of what what's the base sense of that? What's the alternate? Like when you say that there's an alternate, what's that sort of material expectation? Sure. Yep. So um, that alternate is um, price wise, they're the same. You can either go with an organic infill. So whether it's you know the coconut, whether it's um, the the pine, you know, there's a lot of different options out there. Um, but that's one option, and kind of similar pricing is if you did a coated rubber. So um, a coated rubber is basically that crumb rubber and it gets encapsulated. Um, and that's what, let's see who has it. Um, like Harvard has it, um, a lot of MIT has it, um, a lot of other places have it. And it's just, you know, it's just taking rubber and it's, it's basically putting a cap over it. It's taking something that is already safe and making it even more safe, if you wanna okay. kind of think of it that way. Um, typically it's a color green. Um, which, you know, theoretically kind of, you know, keeps the turf a little bit cooler. But um, in reality, if, if, if cooling the turf or keeping the turf just slightly cooler um, is really going to, you'd want to go with an organic infill um, as opposed to a, a crumb rubber. But there's trade-offs because, you know, from, you know, organic infill is supposed to play a little bit more like natural grass, but in those early spring season months, then it's playing a little bit more. You're, you're a little bit more wet you know, in those spring seasons, early spring, um, when you may be on those fields or want to be on those fields, whereas crumb rubber or just um, encapsulated rubber will will dry out faster, um, yeah. potentially melt snow a little bit faster, things like that. So you have the cost there for both. Um, and it's, it's, you know, there's a cost difference, but in the grand scheme of things, it's, it's not enormous. So um, typically what we will do is put in a base bid for, um, you know, crumb rubber and then have an alternate you know, for like we've kind of outlined here for whatever, um, you know, alternative infill you're looking for. And then as far as like sourcing materials and whatnot, and kind of is to this... like, I, like so a couple of years ago when we were starting to dig into this, I know there's a lot of questions around like safety and is it safe for the, the players on the field and stuff like that? And just wondering, um, I mean, like you can go out there and research whatever you want to find for an answer, right? There's all different sides, but just wondering if even hearing from you guys, like what is the latest and greatest and the best resource when we get questions around safety for the players? Sure. Yeah. 
So, so most of those questions come for like how do, the the big topics are um, you know is crumb rubber safe you know which it is um, you can look at the EPA's most recent study um, showing that you know there's nothing that's coming out of that or, or nothing can come out of that to to cause you know heightened concern or anything like that um, you know heat is kind of the next big thing and just when you're having you know kids playing on this surface because synthetic turf just naturally does. It, it, it has higher temperatures than natural grass. In the Northeast, it's not for very long. Um, and it's a huge difference between when you have a sunny day and then when a cloud you know, goes in front of the sun, you see this massive you know, heat change. So those are the things that you know, are gonna come up that you need to consider and then just decide what's the best you know, system and surface for you. Um, but in, return, you know, in regards to you know, health and human safety, um, you know, all the systems you know, are shown as being safe. From a, from a procurement of materials perspective, does your opinion assume that um, we would be sourcing through whatever might be available to municipal buyers in, in the Commonwealth or how, do, how does sort of your, how do you estimate sort of the procurement costs? Yeah, so this assumes just a typical design bid bill um, so it's, it's not assuming costs coming from, you know, any sort of um, buy board or anything like that. That's certainly something we can consider. You know, um, we don't typically recommend it on, on the turf side. We have done it on the, the lighting side, which obviously doesn't apply to you guys here. Um, all through a buy board, you can only buy the actual material. So then you have to, you know, you have to bid the actual installation anyways. So you know, we found that from a cost standpoint, I don't know that there's a huge savings. If it, unless you're really dedicated to one manufacturer that you have to have, you know, sure. um, doing a traditional design bid build, you know, gets you the best price for, for turf. Um, you were talking a little bit during the presentation about kind of the area behind the softball field where there's, you know, some, machinery. Um, I gotta say some of that I didn't follow and I'm curious how much of that is, is I, I heard something about like the water refill station and things like that. I mean, we're, we're going to have to trim the fat wherever we can. How much of what you described in that section of the field is kind of a must have and what's a nice have? For so, it, you know, the real cost that you're seeing there is um, just actually fencing around the equipment that's back there. Um, and then moving that shed that's back there as well. So, you know, if we, if we you know, didn't do all the, the paving and things like that, that you see there kind of that, that grayish material is just new pavement to kind of make that area behind just a little bit more pleasing, easier for people to have, um, from an access standpoint. So it's, I think it's desirable. I think we wanna make sure that anywhere, um, we want, always wanna make sure that we provide um, accessibility, you know, to the field, to the team areas, um, that we have the right, you know, distances in between things so people can move, you know, appropriately in and out of the space. Um, but I think that, you know, it's not a large cost in there, but it's certainly something as you get into like real design and you start to kind of decrease that contingency, that's a spot that could be looked at. I mean, you know, it, in terms of, in terms of, as you said, kind of cutting the fat, you know, it, this area, we're, the way we, you know, we have these kind of curved areas that come in around, we're really kind of going to the edges of the existing slopes. But, you know, if Kelvin kind of moves through this, like that kind of area to the far right, that's in, you know, like the, the curve of a D, you know, those are areas that don't necessarily have to be there for the rectangular sport necessarily, but it's also great spots for you know, warm up areas. Um, it's great spots if you have, you know, a lot of little kids, you know, you're bringing little kids to play in these fields. It's a lot of smaller areas that you can capture. It's not necessarily gameplay, um, but it's gonna give you the most flexibility. So those are the things that we can start to think about like, all right, well maybe that warm up area or that, you know, small area for, you know, younger play or something like that doesn't need to be there. Maybe it can be natural grass. So those are the things that we could start to play with and, and kind of, um, you know, narrow down the areas of turf. I think to add into that, Meg, you kind of touched on it, is the accessibility piece of this one, because I think once we put a shovel in the ground at this site, moving forward, that's going to be a big topic, just because 
on our end. And Meg, I, I shared with you that report. Um, the town's making a significant push for accessibility. So especially with the dugouts and behind and access from the parking lot, and then obviously turf all around, just accessibility of the entire site. Um, I, I think it'd be a no brainer behind it. And Kristen really, I think we just lost her actually, but um, it's just improving on what's there pretty much, correct? I mean, mm -hmm. maybe the water fountain's not, that, if I were to take anything, it maybe be the water fountain, mm -hmm. um, you know, but the, the Musco cabinets could use a sprucing, they always can. Um, and the shed is necessary just because of storage of softball and other, you know, camp equipment, softball equipment, event equipment, there's generators in there, everything like that. So um, to answer her question, if she's watching now on YouTube, it's more of just improve. <laughs> it's more of just improving uh, what's what's already there. So. And I think like those little like the water thing like they're like I mean they're in the breakdown. I I looked it up, but they're like little things. But they're like little like that would be really nice. Uh, you yeah. know what I mean? And like just we're spending this much money on the field, and there yeah, there's a water fountain there. So if we could just fix it up and like bring it back, that would be nice. Um, yeah. Okay. I mean, but also when you're looking at cutting the fat or things we seem unnecessary right off the bat with the netting, you know, yep. 100, 130,000 plus going mm -hmm. around. So that's pretty lean fat right there to take off and, you know, not canning a $5,000 fountain that everybody right. can benefit, benefit from. from. So we'll get the fountain sponsored. <laughs> I like it. There we go. There you go. <laughs> like Ken's dressing. <laughs> All right. Any other questions that we can address? I mean, I think um, if you'd like, we can update and take out. Um, you guys tell us we can take out that netting along Cordeville and update the the cost estimate, you know, accordingly. Um, you know, I think that's kind of the, really the only item. So that's pretty easy. I mean. Well, actually another one. So I'll, I'll put it to the commission's foul poles. Yeah. Do we, do we want those? Uh, we don't have don't, them now. Yeah, I, so. I think we could get by without foul poles. If, I think if we were playing this more league, Matt, you know, league games on this field, could be necessary, but just being the men's leagues and then the, the younger girls, I mean, I, I don't, I'm not sure because we're not hosting, you know, big games. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah. Okay. So one other question is following up on the ADA stuff. Um, so all the synthetic turfs, this is considered fully accessible, right? Um, Cause I know we get a lot of that whenever we touch fields, they want like walking paths around the edges, but like the turf is considered fully accessible, right? It is. Yeah. I don't think MAAB has said like specifically that it is, but I mean, it meets the, it meets the standard of what an accessible path would be, which is to have, you know, a firm stable surface. So this would certainly fall into that category. Okay. And like, and this is, and I think I saw like, it was the, the, like the ramping that's to make it accessible, right. To get up on to, like, so that there's no like ledge between the turf and like the pavement or whatever, right? Okay. Correct. Yep. Yeah. Anyone else have any questions? I'm just, I just want to say this is great, Megan and Kelvin. So thank you very, very much. Um, yeah, no, it's, uh, us with it's, this. it's great to actually have like, you know, some math not not you know some math and some sort of like science that hey you know this there can be something that's done with the field here and you could find a way to utilize the the configurations yeah absolutely proving everything we've talked about for the last three years <laughs> <laughs> yes check check one check. <laughs> great well why don't i um why don't you guys take, you know, a little bit of time, you know, a week or so, if you want to pour through that estimate, you know, any more, um, we can make, you know, the updates that you had mentioned, uh, but, you know, take out the foul poles, you know, take out the ball netting on Cordoville. Um, and then we can, you know, we can finalize it. We'll finalize those plans.
Um, and then we can get those back to you guys for your use. And then I think that'll probably wrap up the study. Um, but, you know, obviously we're here, you know, we're a phone call away, you know, as things come up, um, any questions that you guys have. So we're just happy to answer anything like that for you. And um, we'd love to be back with you guys. Thank you very much. Thank you very, very much. All right, great. Thanks, guys. Have a great night. Thank you. You, too, you too. Thank you. All right, bye. Bye. It's exciting. Yeah, it fits. I, yeah. As soon as I saw it come across, I went around the house. And I'm like, I told you it fits. It fits. <laughs> <laughs> I know what I'm talking about. <laughs> So I, I guess, correct me if I'm wrong, I thought we were always looking at Nipper at, at Chote 1 the whole time, were we not? Were we thinking of phasing that out? So the smaller piece there? Yeah. I think the conversations that we've talked about were, you know, well, first of all, was what what's the, uh, what was possible, right? So check, you know, we got that. Then the next part becomes how much does it cost? Um, and then what, what can what can you reasonably sort of expect to be able to accomplish? And so to me, it was always sort of uh, the first priority was the right-hand side and the second priority is the left-hand side. So, mm -hmm. you know, um, now if we can, if you get the left-hand side included and we think about a few other things that we can use it for, then that now it, the phasing is hard, right? Because they're already there. It probably costs less to do it all in one shoot than it would if you were to phase. Um, so it'll just come, it'll come down to what we think is, you know, feasible from a... Well, that, know, that's a good point level. though. And I'm sorry, my, if you couldn't tell from the beginning, I'm having problems network and my phone to charge. Um, so I cut out there at the end, but uh, I mean, that, if we didn't cover it, Tim, that's a question on um, can they maybe give us a sense of the price difference if we phase it versus do it all at once? Because, I mean, at the end of the day, we need it, right? Everybody, I mean, I'm dealing with right now, I literally have four reschedules to do, and so does so many other people in town between COVID and the weather. And I would hate to see any one age group kind of, ideally, we're, we're satisfying all age groups. So I think it would be compelling if we could argue, you know, hey, we're going to save X amount of money and we might get more younger parents potentially if, if we were able to do both. So, but I mean, obviously we're bound by what we can raise. Um, right. Uh, I mean, my guess, my guess, Kristen, is you're talking 20, 25%. Yeah. So, my and, and, and like, does the town have the desire to like, you know, draw this out or just get it all done at once? So, I mean, there's so many factors that go into it, but I think we should understand, you know, Don, to your point, like approximately what kind of price difference are we looking at potentially if we phase it versus just doing it all at once? Yeah. Tim, could you pass that on if, if it wasn't mentioned when I was off there? Yeah. Thank you. Cool. What are our it's thoughts? Because there's actually there's even enough space. Like when you look at the, I have the, I have it up on my computer here. That the the tilted feel. There's even enough space to actually have room for the parents on one side. Because that was sort of one of the things. Like yeah. if you put it up against the road, it was going to be like, where do you put the kids and where do you put the parents? And there's actually room. Right. Yeah. And and by the way, to the left there, Don, isn't that big enough for pickleball? No, it's absolutely big enough for pickleball. So, Are you kidding so, me? There, there you go. We catch more a demographic that may otherwise. We just, we, well, just got the the we just got the senior vote. That's what that well, was. Well, yeah. well, look, you know what we do is we, we like, honestly, no kidding, right? We fix the wall and you put like a, a something that you can actually walk along there. And then you put a, a I don't know if the crosswalk from the senior center is right in front of the, the senior center, but you put the crosswalk yeah. there. And then you buy a little shed where we can put the pickleball nets and then they can pull them in and out. Like I, I, I was searching it. The UK, awesome. they have like pickleball on turf everywhere up there. And we were driving by, Kaylin pointed out that in Westboro, they've got those pickleball courts across from the lake. And she said on Saturdays, it's absolutely packed. So actually, I mean, we, we joke, but that really should be part of the plan because that's going to get us more support. It truly is a facility for all ages. You know, not just you know youth sports. 
So just one question uh, on this particular location, Tim. Um, it, does the does this does the space that we're looking at here fall under the restrictions of you can't use it during school? That's super gray. I think it's it's, it's like it's just like Finn. I think. Um, I mean, you look at it now, it's, it's being sworn by gym classes. So, but usual circumstances, it's not even touched usually during the day, unless it's beautiful out. Um, I just wonder because so, of so its you status, because towards... it's, it's part of the Cho Trust, right? Or something like the part to the left. It's technically not school grounds, but they are using it, right? Just like the baseball diamonds are technically, the Mooney complex is not school grounds, like, the Correct. school, That's I think, what I mean. it's like playground, Finn is the same exact but, thing. Yeah. So, and you like to hope we're, that, hey, we're giving you access to turf. Let the senior center use the pickleball courts during the day. You know, you'd hope so that, be, that, that would be the that would be the, the that would be the balance, right? That would be the trade off. Right. Yeah, and, and I think also the location you're talking about is you can still put a full class, especially because it's turf, even grade, you know, everything. Yeah. You could separate them enough where it's not going to be on the right issue. side. Yeah. Yeah. So really. it's a, it's a legitimate question, but I, I just think so. I mean, I, a fair argument could be made with the, the tennis courts at Neary, you know, and kind yeah. of the same exact thing. It's on the grounds and, you know, pickleball specifically and tennis is out there, you know, all the time, pickleball specifically during the mornings. And we're, we even dealt with that this season of splitting time with the schools to make sure that they had priority, but also that our programs could go. So. Yeah, we got to get that night pickleball set up, Tim. Oh, don't worry. In the works. <laughs> oh, um, we we, we want to sign up. <laughs> Nine o'clock doesn't work for some of us in the morning. <laughs> the commish, yeah. <laughs> These guys were great. They did a really good job. Yeah. They were quick, too. It was great. That was really quick. Right. Yeah. So I, I'll follow up with an email with them, but it's, you know, so potential costs for phasing if we did. So realistically, I mean, what are we talking about year wise? Like we try to give them an idea. Oh, that's such a hard question. Yeah. Because it's because also, I guess, theoretically, you could just put, you could just put their 4% out. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah, you'd have to do that. Yeah, I mean that. Yeah, so that's almost something we could figure out on our end. Yeah, but, we totally could. They gave us the they gave us the scale. Yeah, because that would be a separate bit, obviously a separate bidded project. So. Yep. Hey Tim, well, then, um, oh sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead. No, 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 no. I have a question about the fields, but it's off topic, so let's finish this one. Um, I'll I'll just mention pickleball. It doesn't sound like that would be much more of a cost, but I'll just make sure. Mm -hmm. um especially if we're talking about paint um temporary paint that was my question to you guys i guess feeling on that temp versus permanent i i the temp just sounds i feel so locked in with the permanent when we don't know you know trend wise to be able to flex like whether the score interest changes right. or the grade sizes change and stuff like that. We, we, we literally laughed about pickleball what how many years yeah. ago it was a big joke and now it, it's you know it's it's here and it's real mm -hmm. so that makes me hesitant to, to lock in to with permanent. I guess it, it kind of going what Jen was saying there was lines everywhere I'm just thinking of the softball yeah. side of you know, having the cone for field hockey going out, having the box for soccer going in, um, mm -hmm. and the crease for for lacrosse as well. So, but I, but I'm also on the side of permanent. I just think it's cleaner, it's less work, get it in, be done. But I also think we're seasonal, right? Like I don't necessarily. I, while I get this opens up for more people in general, we have. You know, we've sat down before. We kind of have agreements on 9-11 with soccer and lacrosse. And it, I don't know. Um, well, just keep in mind, too, that we, we're going to need to maximize the utilization of the field. Yeah. Yeah, that's so going to that, change. Yeah. Yeah. That agreement. So that it, it may not just be, you know, it, it may be outside groups. Like, 
the other piece that that we get with this particular location that we don't get with 9-11 is that we'll have full flexibility as to who uh, can, you know, we yeah. won't be restricted as to. Yeah, uh, we'll know. have control. Yeah. yeah. And we'll have pricing opportunities. We'll have a whole bunch yep. of things that we don't have uh, at the other location. Yep. But, but we I, also don't need to decide that now, right? Because didn't she say no. that there wasn't much of a price difference? And, but and the other thing too is I think you could, it's probably a mix, right? You probably make some, you probably permanently line the foul lines or you probably, you know, maybe there's a, you know, maybe That's the outlines get permanently lined and you don't worry so much about the innards and until we, you know, that there's, I think there's yeah. some, we have some room to maneuver. What I wouldn't do is I wouldn't thread it, you know, like that sort of like permanent, yeah, yeah like. Yeah, I think that's my only other thing was that I do like the idea of that warm up spot with like the top right. Yep. I think it would look awkward if we cut it and kept some of it natural. Well, it's great for storage too. Yeah. Yeah. Come the winter, roll everything off, kind of like 9 11. Well, yeah, you, you, winter or even like, you know, what sometimes the, you know, the, it doesn't affect lacrosse as much because the lacrosse field's inside the soccer field, but like you need a place to put the lacrosse nets and you need a place to mm -hmm. put the field hockey nets and like, you need to push the, the soccer nets out of the way so they can play softball. Like you, you need, you do need some place to put stuff um, uh, to make it work. And then you need in a, it, yeah, that's, and then when it comes to like spectators, you have a flat uniform level, you know, ground that is, you know, potentially safer than what might, what might otherwise be. And Did I can't any... imagine like squaring that off is really going to save us all much money, right? That's that's the other piece too. It's like in the in the long run, what do you yeah. what are you really saving? Um, you need it for ADA compliance, which I'm assuming yeah. it's dumb to say, but they've accommodated for any ADA. Yeah, we talked needs. about that while we lost you. So but, yeah. thank you. Yeah, Megan had our actual ADA report, so she had that on hand. So she looked through it before she did everything. Thank you. Um, score, I know, again, it's kind of small, small, small pieces. History of the scoreboard, is. would there be any issue getting rid of that? Was that an Eagle Scout project? Is that something, do we know? Because they're, they're proposing an electronic one, which obviously would be wonderful. Um, but that softball scoreboard, I just didn't know if that was a past Eagle Scout or something that we would get a slap on the wrist if we got rid of. I don't, I don't know. know. Sort of, I, I think it funny... predates most of us. Yeah, <laughs> we can see if there's any little plaque on it. Funny story, once we were coming out of Woodward and the, the numbers were all on the, there were a lot of numbers were on the ground. So we said, oh, Ryan and Caleb, let's be good. Let's help pick them up. So we pick them all up. And next thing you know, like, kids got slugs all over them. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, I don't think it's, uh, if there's not a little plaque or something, I, I would think we can probably ask a couple people, but it, it doesn't seem to be something that's really very treasured. Mm. Would be a good Eagle Scott project one way or the other. Yeah. Sure. Oh, hey, random. Speaking of the storage shed, do you guys know we had a second generator that lived at Woodward in that shed? No. Nope. Yeah, What's I didn't for? either until I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so we were there for trunk or treat and DPW moved the generator. They're like, no, your other generator is already here. I said, no, I don't know what you're talking about. So I don't know if that was from when the lights were plugged into a generator or. Yeah, that's what oh. must be in trouble. Yes. Okay. Doreen and or Brian were like going down and babysitting the generator <laughs> while the lights were out and we got our hands left, I think, for that. So you're wondering, we have two generators in our department, so. Alrighty. I'll call you in the next day. Two concerts a night we could do. <laughs> a festival. Uh, Multi-location. There you go. I like it. Summer nights cross town. Nice. All right, cool. All right. Yeah, I feel like anything else, people can just like email Tim. Um, and, so, and this is um, 
to, how did now how is this how are these materials available are these materials available for people to look at tim or how does that work what do you mean like the the what they displayed is that something we could share uh with folks like so we oh yeah. you know like so Kristen and i went and met a couple or we did some you know, talk to Shrewsbury and, and, and a few places. And then there was a few people in town that we were talking to to gauge interest and what could we do about um, raising funds and things like that. And I think the Christmas is sort of that first box in the list of, hey, you got to have something conceptual to like share with people. And I'm, and I, I'm wondering now if we've got something for that group to take a look at to get some feedback. Yeah. Yeah. Why These are no time to be present. Why wait? Yeah, I can get this on our website, but also the town website under rec commission. If you want yeah, to so we can post these ones. Yep. You know what? We should be careful though. Um, not not in not sharing it, but positioning it because people are gonna if we don't have some sort of context and that we plan on fundraising and everything, all of a sudden they're gonna be like, "Well, look at rec. Isn't that convenient? They just put out a two point five million dollar you know project plan." <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like. Yeah, yeah. That, that's my only thing. I think we need some context yeah. with. We could just label it as study. Or we something. yeah. Or put we a, could put a put a cover sheet of what exactly it is. Yep, and they could be oh, posted no. with tonight's meeting minutes too, as like these are our documents yeah. from the meeting. Oh, right. okay. Yeah, that's good. Yep. Okay, great. Then my super don't know, my super I don't know how detailed my notes are. I'm glad there will be another yeah. one. <laughs> yes. So like nine exactly. by nine, ten by ten. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, just as long as you get all the pickleball comments, we'll be okay. I definitely got the pickleball comments. <laughs> you will forever be known now as Don Pickleball Dumont. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so we've got, I know it's getting late, but like, so some, any department updates for like fall events or wrap or anything, Tim? Um, I heard, yeah. I heard through the grapevine that you've got uh, the Wachusett bus running again. Yes, we do. Yes, we do. Um, and it's pretty much full. I think we only got like a handful of spots. So that was great. Uh, Ski Ward, not so much though. So Ski Ward, um, I guess we'll make it official tonight. Not that I think many people are watching, but we're putting it out tomorrow. Ski Ward changed their entire model um, this, uh, this season. So they're not allowing, if you go lessons only, you can't have free ski and they're they're restricting the days where kids can snowboard on the mountain this year so and all of that falls on the days that we usually went so our traditional day with grafton that we've been doing for you know like a decade um snowboarders can't come and then if it's kids who just want to go to ski kind of lift only stuff um, that's not possible this year so um we're actually going to be partnering with neshoba so an extra 10 minute so we're going to put that out um, as an option and we'll see how that's received for lessons and, and free ski. So Joe's, Joe's working on that. So kind of a bummer if I'm being honest, just because ski wards in our backyard, but yeah. What are you going to do? It, is what, what was the rationale that they offered or just they changed it? What do you mean? Well, of why they're changing everything? Yeah. yeah. It's, some, it's something, my guess it's, staff if i had to guess um the trends of every other place that you look at um and they said they want to spread out the snowboarding lessons that's my hot take of it's probably a staffing issue when it comes to the snowboard piece of it but not allowing kids to just go for free ski that kind of baffles me um so because that was a majority of when we're looking at neary i believe um it was majority of those kids woodward was mainly lessons so we didn't you know is what it is. But again, the Wednesday that we traditionally went, I believe it was Wednesday, Tuesdays or Wednesdays, the snowboarding one's going to be an option. So we're taking away a whole group of kids right there. So kind of strange, but watch you sits up. Maybe so it'll bounce good. back next year too. So who knows? Yeah, hopefully. Or if, hopefully. or if we're not the only program that drops, right? <laughs> Maybe it will come back next year. Yeah. And that's why, you know, Jen Anderson, the director of Grafton, they, <clears throat> we kind of combined forces on that and we're like listen we're bringing up probably close to 100 100 plus kids like 
can you at least make this exception for us? We've been coming for years and years and years and they were holding firm saying no. So Grafton canceled their skiing altogether. So at least we're, we're going to put out another option with Neshoba. They're super excited to work with us and they were being super flexible with Joe today. He was on the phone with them a lot. Um, so we'll see, we'll see how it's received, but we'll be putting that out tomorrow. That ski word's a no go. Cause a lot of parents are waiting to buy their two. Cause mainly everybody we heard, they were like, we want to buy our season pass. We send our kid but that wouldn't be an option. So we kind of want them to have the, the chance to still go get it. Well, um, thanks for pursuing it and not dropping like Grafton. And, you know, I, yeah. I, and that was not a slight of Grafton. I just mean, thank you guys for taking it. No, me. I get it. Yeah, <laughs> for sure. Outside of that though, um, let's see. So wrap, second session of wrap started um, this week, off and running. Um, I don't have, I do have it in front of me. I did have it in front of me. 27, 27 out of 32 programs are running. So a really, really good session for us. Um, but the the cooler thing is they're not just minimums. They're like really, really stocked with, with kids. So a lot of, you know, karate is huge. This go around basketball is huge. This go around soccer is huge. This go around. So we're seeing a kind of a return of really, really good numbers. Um, so I was really encouraged with that. We had to flip some stuff around, because obviously, because of everything going on in Erie. Um, it kind of worked to our advantage, not to our advantage, obviously, but um, it worked in favor, given the holidays and given the days and, and certain classes that were canceled. We were able to make everything up before the holiday kicks in at the end of the year. So um, vendors were very understanding there. So for vendors who shorten their Instead of doing their five weeks, they have to do four. They're extending their classes, no problem, stuff like that. So um, no real issues, um, no real pushback on anything that we had to do. Uh, we ended up canceling two days of wraps at Woodward to accommodate their vaccine clinics, one happening tomorrow. So we worked with the schools with that. Um, they were really going to shove us in a corner, um, but we kind of took the stance of give the kids the access to the actual clinic. And again, it was one of those things that if we pushed it out, we weren't going to run into any issues. So we just made the call to, to cancel on those days. I know the admin office there was super appreciative that, you know, we could get out of their hair with that. So um, that was really the only, uh, I'd say issue, but it really wasn't an issue. So um, Joe took care of that. Um, he's really getting those relationships down with the schools already. So it's it's, it's comforting. It's kind of, it's really good. The rapport that we have in the office right now. Um, outside of that, did we have, we didn't have heritage day last time we talked, right? It was about to happen. I think. Yeah. 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 We, we, yeah. Okay. we met beforehand. Yeah. You don't care. You're in Hawaii, Jen. So it doesn't matter. <laughs> yep. um, <laughs> so heritage went off. Excellent. Um, crowd was huge. Parade was very well attended. Weather was perfect. It called for rain, but it ended up being a, a gorgeous day. Um, I think some of the stuff that we took away, the bouncy houses, petting zoos, face painting, stuff like that was missed, but it didn't really stop the crowds from coming out. So we had a really, really good attendance. Um, vendors were wonderful. Um, some of the vendors who have been with us specifically, like the Tupperware lady and um, the alpaca farm gentleman, stuff like that, said it was their best heritage day to date with sales and with people coming to the booths. Um, so vendors are very, very happy. Young, uh, yummy Mummy sold out of all of her product with like an hour and a half left. So they were really good. Uh, everything was great. It was great having that coffee truck there that was on point. So <laughs> hopefully bring, bring that back. Um, but Heritage Day yeah, was only, wonderful. Yeah, my only suggestion on that one is, like, kid you not, is they bring two trucks. I think every yeah. parent was psyched to see the coffee we were all in line while the parade we were like is the parade gonna come before i get in line get my coffee and um yeah. it's funny but that was definitely a big difference um then after that we had our first trunk or treat event which was insanity in the best way uh, we, we really didn't know what to expect um we ended up with 10 um 10 vehicles is what we ended with um, I have a list in front of me of who, who we got in. So Boris Selectman did a, did the trunk police did one fire kinder group came out for one supper extended day, chestnut Hill farm, Ted's towing friends of rec, obviously. And then we had our table as well. 
Um, we estimated they asked well, public safety estimated 400 people came through. Um, we had at one point, I think the last person was waiting almost a half hour in line to get through. So it was packed. It was wonderful. Um, a couple of people ran out of candy, had to run out to, uh, the stores for more. So very well attended. Um, then we had that movie night after, and we didn't know how that was going to go, but probably close to a hundred people stuck around for the movie, probably 75 to a hundred people. So, um, that worked great. It was really cold, but the, the kids stuck it out. It's great having the lights on the field, flick those puppies on. Everybody was gone within 10 minutes. Um, so that was great. The parade, um, having fire before us, I think was ideal. Um, they said it was their busiest parade they've ever had, um, which, you know, moved down to us afterwards. So all in all, that was a great success, um, for that day. So kudos to, to Joe, cause he took that under his wing as soon as he started kind of, kind of made it what it was. Um, and then with the gobble wobble is next. Um, so we are assisting the friends, you know, within our means and, um, when, when we can. So right now they got 300 people signed up, which is about standard being a couple weeks out. So we're expecting probably the next two weeks, they're going to see the, the push of it. Um, most definitely the week up just so people see the weather and what's going on. Um, met with them with public safety, kind of facilitated that meeting. Uh, we did that last week with Jolene Chapsky, who's the president now. All good details are all set. Public safety has their plan all set. Um, banners, everything the friends need to do is pretty much on point. They're pretty much locked in. Um, they were able to get their shirts. That was the biggest thing. Um, they ordered their shirts from overseas and they started panicking not making, and they ordered them by boat to save money. So <laughs> I'm, not sure they, I'm not sure they foresee, saw what was about to happen, but um, they arrived at the factory last week and they were printed yesterday. So um, they're going to be shipped out soon. So shirts will be here on time but everything's falling into place uh, we met with board of health as well to talk about the use of trotty or just of keeping people out from congregating inside so where that's going to be the only real difference is it's kind of be going to be a congo line of getting your your registration stuff your shirts your bags whatever is needed and then you're going to shoot out the other side of the gym and pretty much everyone's going to be hanging out outside for safety's sake but gobble wobble is going to be great um, we just need that good weather and it will be uh, very very good and I'm excited for it. Um, but other than that, yeah, uh, RAP started, RAP is underway. A um, couple auxiliary programs started up. So men's basketball is back. Um, worked with Faye. We got time at Faye for two hours on Sunday. And then they're at Finn um, tonight. Actually, they're playing right now um, for two hours on Tuesday. Um, the school is working with us. I, I appreciate it so much. So Fay Gym is actually set up a desk right now, but they, uh, we were down there today working with facilities and getting the layout done. So they're allowing us to move off the desks when we show up, have our program. And we have, it's kind of crazy. We have 45 guys and gals, um, right now playing in the league. Um, it pretty much comes down to a desk, a desk, a person. So, um, they showed us how to set them up put them back, take them away, everything like that. So we're appreciative with the schools working with us with that, but men's basketball is going, um, or adult basketball, excuse me, is going adult hockey is coming back as well. Um, so the 35 plus crew is coming back to St. Mark's. So that is booked. It's scheduled to start, um, the Sunday after Thanksgiving, who knows if it'll be cold enough because it's an outside rink. Um, but they met, they exceeded their minimum that they needed to make the league run. So that's definitely a go. So we're excited that's coming back. Obviously, like we talked about, skiing's coming back. Um, Joe just finalized uh, ice skating lessons as well. Um, so that's gonna be coming back. It's not gonna be at St. Mark's. It's gonna be at New England Sports Center, I think in Marlboro, um, the skating facility there. Um, they got us a really good deal with a couple of options of different days, uh, much more affordable than um, if we were to do it at St. Mark's with that rental fee. Um, so that's going to be announced. Um, pickleball started up upstairs. Uh, so pickleball is back inside. And then he's got about four or five other on his desk, just waiting to finalize some stuff. Um, we're looking into spring, obviously now. Um, he's planning summer. We just finalized some pricing on summer. We just put out some surveys on summers. You guys might, may or may not have gotten it. It's kind of targeted on what families went. 
just the gauge again with field trips and how people are going to feel heading into next summer, but also just because we didn't do field trips um, and it had such a successful summer, we just kind of wanted to gauge the interest of, of bringing those back as it does drive costs and stress of, of us and transportation. Um, but we're starting to think about summer, which is nuts. Um, we already got the okay from the schools tentatively to go back to Woodward, so we're good with that. So summer's full swing. Joe's already working on session three of RAP. He's just about done. Um, from what I was hearing today, because we want to publish that, get that out there in the next brochure. So he's um, he's great. So just, he's Joe's killing it with, with the program piece of it. So very happy in that regard. Um, but general update wise, that's it. That, that's really it before we get into uh, the project. So. Um, I just want to say that Kaylin and a couple of her friends are doing the bowling. They loved it. They've only gone yeah. once, but they loved it. And I said, all right, yeah. now do your job and talk it up um, and make sure kids know how much you love it. But it's unique and, and different. And I think she was all excited because Apex was decorated for Christmas. So um, so just nice job on a new idea. Yeah, it was funny. We um, just as a side note. So Joe was going to go, obviously. Why wouldn't you want to go bowling while you're at work? Uh, but um some of the uh the days at neary didn't fill up so we gave belinda the opportunity she's a monitor over there to take them bowling and she did turns out yeah. she's like a shark she's got her own ball everything <laughs> she plays she plays on the weekends and leagues anything like that so she's having a I'm grand not surprised but that's amazing that's exactly what i said that's exactly <laughs> what i said kids, and not that i mean i think the kids would have had fun with joe but they've also known her forever too so exactly exactly so cool. but yeah, it's, it's kind of crazy. Like a thin one of the days is close to 90 kids we have after school between three programs. So the numbers we're seeing now, it's, it's encouraging that, that people are starting to come back. So it's good. Um, projects, cool. Yep. Just keep rolling. Okay. Yep. Um, Mooney status quo, we're still in queue, we're still waiting. So nothing on that one. Um, Neary, it's funny what happens when you apply pressure, especially legal pressure. So Neary's back on site, um, Island's back finishing up. So they are trenched halfway up the road. I believe they're just waiting on inspection right now um, before they, they backfill what they dug. Um, so there's that piece work-wise. So Island's back in action and that is getting to the point where it can be before connection. And then um, Calander, I know I sent you guys the email, um, but we were very, very happy with that bid, obviously coming in as low as it did. Um, uh, once you take in, so we take into account the contract administration piece with Traverse, um, we're about 100, between 130, 140 grand underneath um, our budget on that one. Um, so that was, that was tremendous. Um, I'm excited to have Alan back, North Turf back. Um, as I mentioned, they did the Petrie and we all know how that turned out, especially this season. So um, I'm super, uh, super excited with that. Obviously the price is great. I think it kind of puts us in uh, good measure with CPC as well, giving money back <laughs> so, <laughs> in order for us to ask for it back to do something else. <laughs> so, um, and Jen, I didn't know if you want to talk about the, the funding piece just because you handled yeah, that. Yeah, so we raised CPC last week. We um, we went back to talk to them about the both lighting projects because both of them ran over. So CPC, actually, I just got an email tonight um, that Freddie Gillespie, who's the contract like consultant for CPC, reached out to the our state rep who provides guidance. So the guidance was is that CPC is not allowed to fund overages, and we are not allowed to go back to the town to ask for like next town meeting to ask for money to cover overages. So it sounds like CPC can't do anything to help with the like I think it's like. 25k or so 23 23 okay 23k over um so now like tim and i were texting tonight saying we now we need to start conversations with the town to figure out like what does this look like and what are our options um and if we want to or if i don't know there's um 
like, so the CPC consultant gives us advice and, and what other towns are doing. So we can also potentially ask our own town council for advice or what they think is within the laws of the governing body of CBC. So I think right now it's probably on Tim to poke around a little bit and see what's what's available, like what other funds, like we pay in a lot of maintenance, all the fees collected for fields go into the general fund. Is there money there to help cover these overages? And um, when Is there we, a concept behind why it wouldn't fund or wouldn't be, I mean, I wouldn't automatically fund the overage, but if the overage was for a reason outside of the control of the project, like, is there a reason why they say they- So, I, yeah, so it goes back to the, um, like the legislature around this these tax dollars, how they're collected and how they're expended. So, and because it was a town meeting vote, um, so that's what I asked if we could go back to town meeting with the overage and cover it. And they're saying like, it's basically the summary I got was it, it's like scope creep almost. And they won't pay for scope creep. Like the funds aren't allowed to be used for that, but that's where like. Um, so what happens in the case of the Calander project where we do not utilize the, yeah. the funds? So like whatever we, whatever is not, actually there's a lot of projects on the docket for CPC that have funds remaining that we've been going, or the CPC has been going through to figure out where it stands. Any money that is not spent when a project is closed out, it goes back to that CPC like funding bucket and can be redistributed. So like what, so this calendar comes under that extra 120 or whatever will go back into I think it came out of the recreation or open space bucket for CPC. It will go back into it to be redistributed for another project. Can I ask Jen, it's my understanding. I think I have a wrong understanding. Does Southboro have a recreation bu bucket or are we under that undesignated? So there, so there's a, and I forget the exact wording now, but there's some sort of like, open space or recreation bucket we do okay. have we do have one i didn't know if we had a specific I, I was just thinking back to the last town meeting it seemed like it was coming out of undesignated so i didn't know so it also depends on like what funds have been burnt down or not right okay yeah. um like like if, i think it's like the housing bucket has a ton of money in it because nobody's asked for any of those projects right yep. um historical has nothing right we've spent all that and more so mm -hmm. yep And just so, so yeah. we know that the overage to for you guys, it mainly comes from national grid. The 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 estimate for the poll that we got was accurate for a single poll. What the electrical engineer and I kind of dealt with that on my end um, didn't take into account, or even if he did know, um, in order to get the proper service, which we knew we could, as he said, and it was true, we need to update other polls to handle that wattage coming in so that's you know for neary it's a almost a thirteen thousand dollar expense to to bring that power over um and what we originally recorded at i think was four or five um so it, it was significantly more and then we already knew we were going over on that bid uh, we took a vote on that to handle the the overage on that um out of revolving as it was not that high um that was taken into account that that low estimate so that's just context i don't know if that was ever explained of why we're over so much so and like jen and i were talking it's just not a hit that we want to take obviously absorb at, at one time i mean i think arguably you know if we really were strapped we could um but you know we just take some time to to rebuild that and we've been taking a lot of hits so <laughs> so yeah. just trying not to do that yep and I think there's especially like if we got the other things coming down the pipeline or like pulling it from multiple different funds. So I think that's what it's in Tim's court to go start asking those questions mm -hmm. and talk to finance to see what our options could be. Cool. Um, any movement on Lundblad? So Lundblad, I, I talked to Karen briefly on it. Um, she said there were some. Uh, preliminary engineering work that was done um, that she was going to gather and get to me. I haven't gotten to date, so but it's to do Friday. So I have a feeling that's why I haven't heard it. Um, but I'll, I'll keep poking on that. Okay. Yeah. Cool. 
Um, so then since we last met, also we've had we've met with capital planning. Um, Don, you want to give a recap of that? Um, I don't know that we really had. Uh, I think we had a few questions, but I think the review of the the capital budget was, I think it went pretty smooth. Um, it was very positive. Was, if yeah, I can interject. Around, I thought it was very yeah, positive. <laughs> yeah. They went around round table, round and around the table. And uh, I think we we explained, you know, we had put the field turf in there, but explained that that was a placeholder and that we really were going to be looking to fund it through, you know, raising funds and whatnot. And otherwise, I think uh, there was a couple of items they were like, you don't even have to put these on here, you know, whatever. And uh, so, no, I think we got out of that uh, pretty clean. Yeah, I think the one other takeaway I, it's, it sounded like they were interested, interested in us, like packaging up the next couple projects and sending them through together, which um, I feel like we've had some over the years, like mixed messaging, like break them all up into individual warrant items or, or like however we handle it. But um, it seemed that capital sentiment was that they should be packaged together so that, you know, it kind of, it gets voted through together and it's not picked apart, um, which I thought was kind of interesting feedback to us. Um, also, they didn't really balk at the idea of like a 10 grand placeholder once we get into rotations, which was great to see. They seemed actually, they kind of picked that out and seemed really fa favorable. Um, so that was, that was also encouraging. Yep. Um, and then I guess kind of like along the same lines is, um, so for, so our capital plan is in there, but we also need to get our budgets in for the town town budget for town meeting warrant, right? Um, so do you have do you have those budgets, Tim? I mean, like, uh, so our budget is basically just salary. Um, so it is, but I, I also wanted to throw something at you. So okay. so yes, our our budget is salaries. Um, the the good thing of, of Joe being new is that he's coming in at a rate that would have equaled out to what we were supposed to pay out this year, if that makes sense. So there's no increase for the program coordinator piece. Uh, we were we were asked to um, work off a 2.8% increase um, of salaries. That's obviously well yet to be determined on what's yeah. going to be done. Um, but all that calculated out um, is just 144,977 in salaries, um, which is a 1.2% increase, which is pretty, pretty standard, um, when it comes to that, the two things, so these are due Friday. So, and I already kind of talked to Mark and Brian about this, that I kind of wanted to throw at them, get their take, um, and I feel like it's blasphemy for Rep to put another line in <laughs> outside of what we already have. Obviously, the other one's 911, having that payment in there. Um, that payment last year was 10,258, so that was put in same same percentage, no no increase. The two things I was going to float by him um, was one. So Trails Committee is under our umbrella, as we know, um, but also I think for all of us who have been here for a couple of years. Trails is pretty significant. It's starting to be kind of a significant committee. Um, so we've been funding a lot of their, we've been funding all of their requests um, out of our accounts. Um, and I think it's starting to get kind of gray. I think it's starting to kind of bend those rules um, with a lot of it, um, especially when it comes to the conference, you know, conference membership stuff, um, tools, maintenance, things of that nature of, you know, uh, you know, publishing a bid of uh, like public meeting notices, things of that nature. So, so I asked Trails to put together a preliminary budget of what they think they may have. Um, they got that to me a little while ago. Um, so I'm going to put that forward to get Trails their own line item. I know there's some, I think Trails have been looking to do it for quite some time. I'm just in the feeling that it's time just because, I mean, they're in front of the selection a lot now too. They're trying to expand their committee. They're looking to add members. Um, and it's, again, no secret, the, the scope of what they do in town. And it's short money. It's about three, three to four grand is what it's looking like. But still, I mean, that's three to four grand coming out that we have no return on. Um, so that, that's money we're eating every single year. 
Um, so it's the conversation of if it stay also is if it stays underneath us or if it gets moved to DVW um, because it kind of falls more under their purview when it comes to field maintenance and, and things like that. So that conversation is going to be had, um, but I am going to put that in um, as an item and we'll, we'll see what happens. I think that completely makes sense. I mean, you also like look at last year, how many more committees came forward asking for like a couple grand to cover like meeting notes and like all that stuff. Like, yep. I think it's completely warranted. So especially with all, yeah, all the work that they've been doing. So no, no, it makes perfect sense. And then the other one I was going to add into is uh, playground inspections. So We've been funding those out of, you know, third-party inspections, um, professional inspections. Um, we've been funding those out of revolving. Um, I think it's, I don't think it's great. I mean, we use the playgrounds for programs and things of that nature, um, but it's a hefty expense. Um, so, but also to add in um, the schools as well to kind of take that under our purview, especially if it's going towards us when it comes to ADA and all the studies that are coming out. Um, so I talked to Fantoni on that um, and it was in the past, it was something DPW did, but it was something that schools did, but it was something that REC did. So again, we're getting into that shadowy area of, of what is. So hoping to bring that to the forefront again. Um, so I had the official quote done from the provider that we use, uh, New England inspections are pretty much the best in the state. They do the entire state and the islands. Um, so that's $3,375 to get all the schools and all the public playgrounds. So um, that was going to be the other ask I was going to put in um, as well. So th those would be the two additional things and we'll, we'll see what happens. And are those inspections annually? Yearly, or yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. I mean, that's just the right thing to do. Yep. Yep. I agree. So the, the total budget, um, I don't know if we want to vote on it, but um, the total budget request for FY23 would be $161,610. And I all in all, yeah. That, yeah. Yeah. Sorry. I think we should vote on it. I think we're expected yep. to vote on it. Yeah, I know we are. So, you have a motion? I make a motion to approve the budget in the amount that Tim just quoted. <laughs> All, right. Okay. All right, so then roll call vote. Hanson, yes. Ode, yes. Laval, yes. Imad, yes. So then you're I apologize. Set. I don't have it up on screen and I got two different laptops right now. So I'll send that out as well. So you guys have a hard copy. Okay. To, to look at. That works. And then um, the other thing I had on in here was we were going to, um, so Tim had sent around like the final quote for the programming tent it actually came in lower than we thought it would. So now that we have the official final quote, just want to take a vote on that so that Tim can, order it and purchase it whenever makes sense. Yeah, so I, the hold up last go round was we were just confirming it could be put up on the pavement, which it can. Um, in order to do it, we just need to, we needed to buy um, the proper plates that the poles would stand on for um, the setup. So the adjusted quote taken into account, the six plates that we need for the footings would be $6,250. And that's for a custom, custom tent with our logo on it. Wow. Yeah, they pretty nice. And we're just getting one. Let's deal with this, and then I'll tell you what I was about to say. <laughs> <laughs> Any questions on the tent, or we want to take a vote? All right. I, so, I do have one. Question. I do have one quick question. Go for it. Like, um, is there any sort of discount if you got two instead of one and would there be value in having two? I think there'd be, I mean, I think there'd be a value um, in the long run. I mean, I, I think the, we've been talking about using this a lot, just the idea we were actually talking about it today with the schools, but like, I, I think the value is that 
camp's going to use it. I bet you senior center will probably use it. Heritage Day will use it. Summer nights, we're going to use it. So I think it's going to be used significantly. If we had two, yeah, we could space that out and spread it about. But um, I also think maybe we see how the first one works out and then go from there. Sounds good. Because we can even save like money and not throw the logo on it. We can save, you know, 800 bucks. It'll be even cheaper. Yeah. <laughs> but it's and, nice. And to I, I don't want to, uh, oh, I think it's definitely necessary. Um, I don't want to uh, hold up the vote by any means, but I'm just curious if, if when making this type of purchase, if you, you know, if you do realize some savings, if you buy, you know, two at a time versus one, um, again, I don't want to hold up the vote or the purchase, but then again, we could make the vote. You could inquire because it's not like you're purchasing the tent tomorrow. And if we find mm -hmm. out, you know, it, it, it there is then we may just want to reconsider that's all so i mean my two cents and coming out of the business of printed tents like this like there's there's usually no cost savings because it's two individual items right it's not like you're buying more of something it's actually two separate items two separate printings so i, I guess i like the thought process but i guess it comes down to necessity too mm -hmm. like if we feel especially with summer, like, okay, we need another one. Like then maybe we, we cross that bridge, but you might as well start with one and, and go from there. So. Yep. Cool. All right. So someone will make a motion. I make a motion to um, approve the budget required for the purchase of a a what is a, a tent for use by recreation in the town in the amount quoted by Tim. Okay. I can second that. All right, so roll call vote. Hansen, yes. Ode, yes. Laval, yes. Dumont, yes. Cool. What I was going to say is the big tent that we got is they're no longer allowed to be used because the guidelines shifted because of the crazy weather. So now any outdoor tent that we use has to be able to withstand like hurricane winds and like all this stuff. So the ones that the schools use and the ones that we use do not. So their permit wouldn't pass with the town anymore. So <laughs> yay. Oh, wow. <laughs> so glad we didn't buy one of those. <laughs> <laughs> a good thing ours can be taken down very swiftly so. yeah. cool. Great. all right cool. um, thank you and so i had on the agenda vote on pay rates but i think we did that last time right yeah okay mm -hmm. so that was just a mistake copy paste mistake yeah. um any master plan updates hey, kristen i feel like you and i have been trying to connect on this i don't know if i owe you anything where we're at at this point no, 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 it's with me. Um, so our next meeting is next Wednesday. Um, comparative, I, I actually just wrote, reached out to Mimi yesterday or today because um, I don't know if, if y'all know, but the last like three weeks I got sidetracked. My daughter was sick and then my son got caught in the fifth grade COVID outbreak and then my husband got COVID from him. So it's been a, a fun couple of weeks and then I made Jen a <laughs> close contact through SEDP <laughs> which is kind of funny because I texted her on Saturday before Halloween to like let her know what was going on because <laughs> Ryan and our two sons play together at South Brook extended and then the next day she's like oh you meant I was a close contact <laughs> um, I was like oh yeah that sucks for you <laughs> sorry Kristen what can I do to help and yeah. did not acknowledge that I was, was a close contact now <laughs> meanwhile I was kind of reaching out to say hey <laughs> Yep. <laughs> Anyways, no. um, so long story short, we still we just got that one section. It really is on me. Like Tim, I might have a couple of questions for you, but you know, it's it's building up the historical information about our facilities. So I, I restarted that up. It is my personal goal to get this done and, and ready to present um, next Wednesday, which is our next meeting. So you know, if anything, I'll run it by. We won't have time to vote on it, though. Nor do I think. I don't know if we're finalizing next Wednesday, to be honest with you, because there's some other sections that are still being worked on. Um, but, you know, at a minimum, I'll run it by you, Jen and, and Tim, or I could send it to people individually. Um, but I think people like the idea of adding the 
history to those fields and areas that don't have or that are named on behalf of someone. And I got a little tip on George Mooney Field um, on how I can track down that history, for example, because it's not online, which kind of underscores even more the, the, the value in doing this and making sure that we capture and remember why we named and dedicated certain facilities um, after individuals or groups of individuals. So um, Ryan got out of quarantine today. Ron gets on, on Thursday, so our life is getting back to normal a little bit here. Um, so Tim, I'll probably will be reaching out to you in the next couple of days, but nothing specific that I'm looking for right now. Cool. So then the last thing on our agenda is to approve meeting minutes from October 5th, um, which are, Don wrote those up for us. So I sent the, around the link tonight and then also October 18th, because I had posted for the capital planning meeting, um, we didn't have quorum. So basically the minutes say we didn't have quorum, go look at capital planning's minutes. Um, but those are the two links that I sent around to you guys tonight. So Ali, I can make a motion to approve the so noted minutes. I second. All right, and roll call vote, Hanson, yes. Day, yes. Well, yes. Dumont, yes. Awesome. So our next meeting, so second Tuesday puts us at December 14th. Does that date still work for folks? Yeah. And I think yeah. the, the brunt of that conversation will actually be the ADA report that Tim summarized and sent to us. That works for me. Okay. Did everybody get that, just to be sure? Yes. Okay. Or I did, at least. Yep, oh, I have it too. I know ADA wants, wants a, a kind of a, just to back of your minds when it makes me, and they kind of want a direction of what we want to take by mm -hmm. the end of December. So I guess we have to kind of decide on the 14th how we want our recommendation of how to tackle it. So I think the 14th, like if we all pre-read that doc, it can be kind of a little bit more of like a collaborative working session to figure out like, what do we think? What do we, yeah. So we can at least have a draft of something. Um, okay. Cool. Anything else then? No? Good. All right. So motion just, to- Can right I just, here. I'm sorry. Oh, can I just okay. clarify? How do we want to post that presentation for Activitas? Do we want to do it with the minutes or do you want me to do it separate? Oh, I was, well, I guess like I won't, in theory, I won't post them until December, right? When the minutes go get posted, but I was going to just submit it as attachments to the meeting minutes, okay. right? That's fine. I just want to make sure just in case I yeah. had to do anything. Yeah, I mean, maybe we can all give it a little thought because again, there's no time like the present, right? This is a long journey ahead as Don and I learned from, from sitting down with Shrewsbury. And so, you know, the sooner we, we start getting out there, the better and, and gaining some support, which I do, I do know, like I can't to every single time we go to a turf field, every single parent, which is basically every away game that we go to these days, um, you know, every parent is commenting about it. So, you know, there's no reason to sit on it in my mind. So maybe we can all give some thought oh. as to what are the next steps and then talk about it in December. Yeah, we could we could throw on like what are the next steps there in December. So you have the documents from Activitas in your your town email accounts. Like yep. those are considered public record. You could share those with whoever. It doesn't matter. We were just yep. saying like how do we post them? So they will get posted with tonight's meeting minutes when the meeting minutes go up in December. So that sounds good. Yeah. And then I would assume we're probably gonna get something from Meg just striking out at least the netting and stuff, just because that is a chunk of change. So that'll. Yep. They'll yeah. put a one instead of a two on that number. <laughs> Great. We can post the revised numbers. Um, yeah. Awesome. Yeah, that's good. Okay. So then, um, so motion to adjourn. I motion to adjourn. Yep. Second. All right. Roll call vote. Hanson, yes. All day, yes. Vault, yes. Dumont, yes. Awesome. Wait. Anybody here from Dave? <laughs> I was actually wondering that he's been a little bit MIA recently, so yeah. I'm I know he's been at the golf. I know he's been at the golf course, but 
Completely <laughs> forgot about us. So.